Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. We came to the subject of angels. Do angels exist? Or are they just a myth or a superstition? If they exist, where did they come from? What are they? Why are they? What is their function? What are they like? When did they start? What do you know about angels anyway? And now we have come in this study to this matter here in the sixth chapter of Genesis. It's been a puzzle to a lot of people where it says it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. That's way back there before the flood. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose and the Eternal said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And so a lot of people wonder, does that mean that angels married human women and that uh, they had children and their children were giants? Great, gigantic people bigger than anything you've ever seen on the face of the earth. That has been a problem to a lot of people. Now, remember that we saw in the preceding program that angels are mentioned in the Bible. And uh, you find them mentioned, for instance, here in the 104th Psalm and the 4th verse where it says that, speaking of God and of his creation and how he has created everything in the universe, it says in verse 4, Who maketh his angels spirits? Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever, and so on. And then we found that was uh, actually repeated over here in the New Testament in the first chapter of Hebrews, and the seventh verse, and of the angels he saith, that is, God says, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. In other words, then, God made them. He's speaking of God's creation, and if he made them, then they were created. So angels are created beings. Now, we find uh, by getting all of the scriptures on angels that... Uh, they are neither male nor female. They do not reproduce. Well, I'll come to a scripture on that just a little later. But God created them. They are individual spirit beings, each separately created, not born. He maketh his angels spirits. Now, the Old Testament, as I mentioned in the preceding program, just assumes the existence of angels, except for the one passage that I just read to you although there are some other books that are not inspired, like the book of Jubilees and Enoch and some of those that mention the creation of angels. But apparently those men knew what was generally assumed in the inspired writings of the Old Testament of the uh, actual existence of angels. Now, when were they created? Well, we turn to Job, the 38th chapter and the 4th verse. We might turn to that once again, just real quickly where God was speaking to Job. Apparently, Job had just built a great building. Some people believe that Job was the actual architect and, and the, uh, the master builder who supervised the building of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, and that uh, he had just completed it. And incidentally, that's quite interesting. It's only a theory, of course. I just pass it on to you for whatever it's worth. But uh, it has been until the Woolworth Tower was built in New York, the tallest building, highest building on earth, and uh, it is the most perfectly constructed building on earth. Now, that's going to amaze some of you, but it is. Those giant stones are so smooth and so absolutely flat and level and smooth that they are laid together one-fiftieth of an inch apart. Now, there are a great many things in the Great Pyramid that are just beyond belief almost. It, it was so perfectly designed. 
And a great many people believe that uh, the Great Pyramid was divinely inspired. In fact, uh, you see things in it that at least certainly make you wonder. And I will say this. I'm not going to discount the possibility at all. I think it's possible it was. It appears, uh, that is, there are a great many evidences to support that theory. However, some people believe that there is a message in the Great Pyramid, and uh, that it shows the history of the world and all that sort of thing, and its inner passages are marked off on a certain rate uh, as you travel along an inch for a year, and finally an inch for a week or a month or something like that a little later on toward the time that we're entering into now or have entered into since World War I. The difficulty with that is it appears to be a matter of higher mathematics, and I'm not myself a mathematician. And secondly, like most interpretations put in the Bible, all we have are interpretations that certain men who at least profess to be mathematicians, have put on it, and I am not satisfied with any of the interpretations I have seen. I have not seen any that I can endorse or accept, and uh, it's a little out of my sphere. I, I do not feel that I've been called to that sort of thing, but to preach the gospel, and whether the gospel is written in that uh, great mountain of stone or not, some people believe it is, the Word of God in stone. Some people go as far as to believe that. Well, there's something rather marvelous about it. But I'm not going to start endorsing and preaching something that I feel that I do not understand, and I cannot accept any interpretation that I have seen. Their interpretations have not come out. If there is anything in it, we should be able to foretell dates in the future when precise events are going to happen. Now, of course, they've been attempting to do that. Then they wait and they look back on history and they'll find something, and you could find it on any day of any year that's ever happened, something that by the methods that I have seen used, you can twist it around some way to say that was a date that had the significance that the thing portended. Well, I think that's just stretching it a little too far. Nevertheless, I, I do not discount it or throw out the possibility of it. And if you want to believe any of the existing uh, theories, why, uh, well, that's all right. I certainly won't quarrel with you. I just can't accept the ones that I have seen. And it may very well be. Anyway, one point about it that is most interesting is this. It's the only type of building that I know of, the only building that I've ever heard of on earth where the cornerstone is the top stone and is laid last. Now, as most buildings are constructed, if you ever noticed, they put the cornerstone on just about the time they start laying the foundation. It's down in the foundation, and before the superstructure is built at all, the cornerstone is laid, and they have the celebration. But on the Great Pyramid, the cornerstone was the capstone, the last stone to be laid as it was completed, and signified the very completion of the building. The cornerstone there is on top. And it is a corner. You know, you would have the four corners at the bottom, but you have a corner at the top, too, at the apex where they all meet. And, strangely enough, if there is a symbolism to the Great Pyramid, that top cornerstone seems to be referred to in the Bible as the stone which the builders rejected that has become the head of the corner in King James Bible language, which means the head cornerstone, the top cornerstone. And it is referring there to Jesus Christ, who came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own received him not. He was rejected. And he is referred to as a stone. Well, here is the stone that was rejected. Apparently, it was never placed there. The top cornerstone is not there. It looks like the builders rejected it. And apparently it must have been perfect. There was nothing wrong with it. All the rest of the building is absolutely perfect. That building must have been perfect. Does the Great Pyramid symbolize in symbolic form in cold stone having been built way back there, probably as far back as the time of this old patriarch Job? Does it symbolize the church of which Christ is the living head? and his completion of it, and yet they rejected him, the chief corner. Now, the church is going to be made perfect, and there's a building that's absolutely perfect. Well, there's just something to think about. 
However, I am sent to preach the Word of God, the written Word of God, which is the Holy Bible. And so let's get back to that. Herbert W. Armstrong will return in a moment. But first, this offer concerning literature of related interest. The arms race continues while international tension escalates. Just how secure is the future for you and your family? With world hotspots flaring up, Bible prophecy endows current events with new meaning. But Bible prophecy can only be understood if you have the principles that unlock the door of biblical knowledge. This free brochure, Keys to Understanding Bible Prophecy, is yours upon request. The intrigue of today's international politics is only the forerunner of the unexpected developments of the future. Request Keys to Understanding Bible Prophecy and open the door of tomorrow today. Send your request to Herbert W. Armstrong, Post Office Box 111, Pasadena, California, 91123. That's Herbert W. Armstrong, Post Office Box 111, Pasadena, California, 91123. Now then, supposing Job, it's an interesting theory, and I'm only presenting it as a possibility, as an interesting theory, but sometimes these things are interesting, and uh, our scientists in this world are generally respected, and I don't altogether believe that the processes of inductive reasoning are, in all cases, the right procedure in arriving at... Uh, an equation or a result or something of the sort, but uh, they use it in science, and uh, sometimes we have to use it. In other words, to postulate a theory, a possibility, and then to look for the facts and see whether it works out. Now, this is interesting from that point of view. I just don't have all the proof yet, and I'm not going to accept it until I see the proof. But my mind's open. I'd certainly be willing to see the proof about it. I just haven't seen it yet. Now, God is speaking to Job. Remember, Job was the so-called perfect man, and yet he wasn't perfect. Job was not perfect. Job sinned. Because you read in your New Testament in the Bible that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, except Jesus Christ. Every other human being that ever lived, and that includes Job. Now, Job was so perfect, however, that even the devil couldn't find anything wrong with him. But God did. And so finally, God took a hand. And God was speaking to him and whittling him down to his own size. You know what was wrong with him? He was so good, he was so proud of it, that he had a lot of spiritual pride. He had his own goodness, but it was his own goodness, which is just like a lot of filthy rags to God. And he was all puffed up about it. And that kind of vanity and pride is one of the worst sins you can have. And Job was one of the hardest men for God to ever bring down to repentance that has ever lived on the face of this earth. Job probably was the most righteous man who ever lived. Do you know who is the, the wickedest man that ever lived? And maybe I'll bring you a sermon on that sometime. I may bring you a broadcast on it. But the wickedest man who ever lived, who uh, probably perpetrated more crimes, more murder, and uh, more things that were evil in God's sight than any man who ever lived, when God began to deal with him and brought him low, that man repented in a hurry. He was a lot easier to bring to repentance than Job, who was so righteous. But God now is whittling Job down here, beginning with verse 4 in uh, Job 38. Where wast thou, said God, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now just postulate, just imagine, for instance, that possibly Job did have the building of the great pyramid, uh, that is the supervision of it, and that uh, Job is the man that was used, uh, if it was of divine uh, inspiration, that God used him as the architect and uh, the builder of the great pyramid. And he was pretty proud of it. Now God says, maybe you built that building down there, but I built the whole earth, and where were you when I did that? Did you amount to anything then? Well, Job just wasn't around, was he? He hadn't been born yet. Job thought he was pretty big. Job was pretty good. Now God begins to compare him to himself. 
And when Job is compared to God Almighty, he finds that there isn't very much to him. You know, my friends, most of you need to stop and sort of compare yourself to God some of these times. And we need to get whittled down to our own size and realize we're not quite as important as a lot of us may have thought. Well, he said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Because measures were laid for the great pyramid. Or who has stretched a line upon it? And that line was stretched in perfect precision on the great pyramid. Uh, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? You know, my friends, the average big building is going to settle and sink a little bit into the earth after so many years, after maybe 50 years, unless it's very, very well built. Well, the Great Pyramid is fastened on uh, foundations that go way down into the ground so deeply that after all of these years it has never settled, I presume, not even a one thousandth of an inch. It's absolutely anchored solid. So, he says, Who laid the measures of the earth here, if thou knowest? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, notice it. Who hath laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Now, there, the word sons of God certainly means angels, because there were no human beings at that time. And all the sons of God shouted for joy, as the final cornerstone was laid on this earth. Now, that's all figurative language, of course. There isn't any actual cornerstone on the earth. He's comparing it to a building. It's being compared to a building on this earth where the cornerstone is the final capstone, the completing stone that is laid last. So there is a little support. It certainly is logical that if the theory of Job having been the architect of the Great Pyramid is true, the whole thing is very consistent. And it's, it's at least mighty interesting, at least it always has been to me, and I hope it will be to a lot of you people listening. Now, the morning stars are the angels. In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, you find angels in the right hand of Christ there in the symbolic vision. And it says that the stars are the angels and so on. And the stars are used as a symbol for angels in a number of places in the Bible. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Shouted for joy. Listen, let me ask you a question about angels. Have you ever read in your Bible, and you have to go to the Bible to find about angels, because no scientist will tell you anything about them. Angels are spirits. He made his angels spirits, so they are composed of spirit, not of flesh. No scientist then knows anything about it, because that's clear beyond his realm. A scientist is uh, confined to the material universe and to, to matter, things that can be seen or felt or heard, smelled or tasted. Well, you don't see an angel unless he's specially manifested. So scientists would probably just poo-poo the idea. They don't know anything about them. They probably say it's a superstition. There isn't any such thing because they don't see it. Well, I don't know. A scientist doesn't say there isn't any such thing as gravity, and he can't see that either. And I don't think you can feel it or taste it or smell it. But we do see what it does, and so they declare there is a law of gravity, but they don't understand much about it. They just know how it works. They know what it does. But you can't taste it. You can't eat it. You can't pick it up either, can you? You can resist it. And you have to if you try to hold a, a pretty heavy piece of lead. You couldn't hold a very big piece of lead either. But the angels now shouted for joy. Well, all right, think about this. Did you ever hear of or read in your Bible about an unhappy angel? Did you ever read of an angel griping and complaining, and an angel that was filled with fear and worry, an angel that had an empty life and was bored with life and didn't want to live any longer? Did you ever read of a griping, grumbling, unhappy, sarcastic, uh, criticizing, uh, grouchy angel? I don't think you ever did. I wonder if you ever noticed one thing. Now, a lot of you people have read the Bible a lot. But you haven't heard many sermons about angels, and you probably haven't thought much about them. 
I wonder if you ever noticed that if the, the state of mind or degree of happiness or sorrow or unhappiness or whatever it might be is ever mentioned in connection with angels, that always they're happy. Always they're shouting for joy. Always they are... Uh, well, they seem to really be getting along pretty good and enjoying life. You know why? Angels are ministers of God. And as I said, they're part of the government of God. They're his messengers. The Hebrew and the Greek words both mean the same that are used in the original writings of the Bible. A messenger or agent. And they are God's messengers or agents used in the divine government by which God rules the entire universe. Not only this world, but the entire universe. They're superhuman, spirit, subordinate beings, subordinate to God. But they're higher than men. And angels, because they're obedient to the laws of God, because they are not uh, in rebellion against God, they're always pictured as being happy and joyful. They radiate joy and enthusiasm and happiness and peace and all that sort of thing. Now, there were some angels. Apparently, angels have had free moral agency because there were angels that sinned. And in one scripture, they're called angels. The angel God spared not the angels that sinned. Well, if he didn't, take heed that he spare not thee is the admonition there. But uh, they are not angels now. They were angels up to the time they sinned. A sinning angel, however, technically in Bible language, is called a demon. Now, demons are fallen or sinning angels that are rebellious to the government of God. And I have seen the working of, uh, of demons. I wonder if you ever have. You probably have seen it and didn't recognize it. Do you know, my friends, that a large percentage of what we call insanity, of people that are mentally deranged and in the uh, mental hospitals, are actually just demon-possessed. There's a demon who has gotten inside of them and is possessing their minds, now, there again, our doctors uh, would, would laugh at the idea. And the doctors don't know what to do about the case, however, because they refuse to recognize what it is. They wouldn't know anything about a demon. They have no uh, uh, gift of uh, perception of spirits. They don't recognize a spirit of that sort. They don't know anything about spiritual things. They're ignorant when it comes to the spiritual realm. And after all, this material realm is, has nothing compared with the spiritual so they don't know anything about it. Well, now we were going to get to this matter before we go on about angels further. Uh, back here, does this mean the sons of God saw the daughters of men? Now, there in Job, the sons of God shouted for joy, and it refers to angels. Well, now uh, turn over with me, if you will, uh, real quickly to uh, Hebrews. Uh, let's just look at this right now real quickly. In Hebrews, the uh, first chapter, it speaks of Jesus Christ here as... The Son of God, whom God hath appointed heir of all things, and all things means in heaven and earth, and that means the whole universe. That means up on Mars, and it means all the galaxies and the Milky Ways and all of the stars that are so much bigger than anything in our solar system. It means that he is heir of all of it. Now, you find here, by whom also God made the worlds, and uh, worlds there meaning ages and, and referring undoubtedly not only to the time element but also to the whole universe. Who being the brightness of his glory, of God's glory, the express image of his person, looks precisely like God Almighty, God the Father, upholding all things by the word of his power. And uh, another and a better translation is that he upholds or sustains the entire universe by the power that is vested in him. Now, Jesus Christ himself said after his resurrection, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power has been given to him. Now, right there is a marvelous thing. Do you realize, my friends, that God the Father has given to Christ enough power that he possesses the power to, well, completely blow up this earth. He has the power to annihilate every particle of life, human, animal, and plant life on the face of this earth. He has the power 
to perpetrate the most colossal destruction that you could possibly imagine. He would have the power to blow up the Milky Way. Now, you ever stop to think about that? Power can be used either for good or for evil. It can be used for construction or for destruction. And Jesus Christ had to prove by his life on this earth that he could be entrusted with power. He was given a little power on this earth, and he used it wisely and rightly, and he has proved that he will not abuse or misuse all that power, otherwise God the Father would never have given it to him. And if we're going to be like him, and if he's only the firstborn of many brethren, and if he's only our elder brother, he is the first to be born by a resurrection from the dead as a son of God, and we are to share his glory and to share his inheritance, and we are co-heirs and fellow heirs with him. My friends, if all of that is true, and we're to be glorified together with him as he has been glorified and given all that power, then a similar power is to be given to us, and it will not be given to you or to any mortal on this earth unless or until that mortal can prove that he can take it. Unless you can prove by the little things given to you now that you can handle power, that you can manipulate it wisely. Faults are bad habits. And they're a slave to bad habits when they come to me for prayer. Men have come to me for a lot of bad habits. And they want to know if it's absolutely confidential, if I'll ever reveal it to anyone. And I let them know that no one will ever know. They confess it. And I have to just remind God how Jesus, there at his right hand, has suffered every temptation and all the weaknesses of human flesh, only he resisted where we don't. And I say, God, you say you're as merciful as the heavens are high above the earth. You look on us as a father pities his children. You know our frame that we're but dust. And there is an understanding Savior. There is an understanding, comprehending God, whose mercy is greater toward us than the heavens are high above the earth. Let us, therefore, says verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That time of need comes repeatedly to most of us. My friends, when I pray, I get the answer. I know God's there. He's answered me not once, not twice, not a hundred times, but thousands of times. You can get all the scoffers and skeptics you want and sneer about whether there's any God. I know God's there. I've had the answer. I've had it so many times I know. My friends, you can have it too. God doesn't love me any more than you. Not a whit. He's no respecter of persons. Why don't you go to that throne of grace in the name of Jesus Christ? It's a very practical thing. Put it to work for you. Now, just a few minutes in closing, I'm going to tell you once again about this. What is faith? Why don't you have faith? Just what is faith and what kind of faith saves you? And I hope you'll write in for this booklet... What kind of faith for salvation? And see, it won't hurt you to put it to the proof and see whether you're on safe ground. Now, the other booklet, Why Were You Born? I think of all of the booklets that we have written, that we've published, that I've been announcing on this program for years and years, that there has never been one more important than this. This lays down before you the whole purpose of life. It lays down the whole of the, the whys and wherefores of this thing that we call salvation. Why do we need it? And just what is it? The name of this booklet, Why Were You Born? Now, jot that down immediately. Now, all you do, first write down the call letters of the station to which you are listening. That's very important, the call letters of the radio station to which you are listening, and then send your name and address printed plainly to Herbert W. Armstrong, Post Office Box 111 in Pasadena, California. That's Herbert W. Armstrong, Post Office Box 111 in Pasadena, California. Until next time this program is on the air, this is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong, sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God. For literature offered on this program. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.